Quench Juice Bar Philadelphia. Minority and vet owned using local vendors for their fruits and adding no added sugar to their products. Available on DoorDash and Grubhub. Grab yours today. Location, 1500 Market Street, Suite 1455, Philadelphia, PA. Grab yours today. Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, Oga from Hip Hop News Uncensored. And sitting across me is my co-host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam, and CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. we got a special guest in the building. Philly's own Hollow Rollo's on the podcast. What's good with you, family? How you feeling, brother? Yeah, what's up, y'all? Chilling, chilling. It's, uh, it's good to have you on, man. So I'm going to throw the mic to my cuz, man. So he set this thing up, man. And he was the main reason why you on here, brother. So the floor is yours, oh. Yeah, nah, man. First, first like I said, um, before we started, man, welcome home. Appreciate um, you. Yeah. Talk to us, man. Let us know how you're feeling. How's everything today, man? Hey, man, I'm feeling good. You know, um, it's always a blessing, man, you know, just to be alive. But, you know, being out here on the other side of the wall, man, I'm just so grateful. Being as though what I went through, you know I mean, just to make it back out this joint. Indeed, right. man. Let the people know, for those of you who don't know, give them a little brief introduction as to who Hollow Rollo is, how you got into hip-hop, some of your influences coming out of Philly and things like that, bro. Well, I started rap when I was a young boy. Um, some of my influences from coming out of Philly was, like, um, major figures. You know I mean, I was vicious. Um dutch ball i mean uh people like freeway it was just people who had like different styles and stuff like that of course beans beans was the hardest thing coming out of the city i mean so a lot of them like you know um it was like role models to me but my favorite rapper growing up though as a young boy was tupac i mean so he always had a lot of influence over me and stuff like that and that's you know that's what that's what got me start rapping and stuff like that right now i know you was doing the dvd era he was going yeah. hard. It was back when uh me, Joey Jihad, all of y'all was, you know, neck and neck at that point in time. Talk mm -hmm. about about that time. Did you have any um were you battle rapping? Did you run into Meek? Anybody talk about that time if you can? Uh yeah, well back then I knew all them boys, but mm -hmm. like I was like I was on DVDs before they actually was, you feel me? And right. um then I wound up getting booked. And once I got booked and did a little time, I think I did like three years that time. When I um, went upstate, I kept hearing the names, Joey Jihad, Meek Mills, Ray Dollars. And I was like, damn, this sounds familiar. So when I when I wound up coming home and I was seeing who they was talking about, I was like, damn, oh, yeah, I know these guys. You feel me? Right. And they was out there killing stuff. Yeah. You cut off a little bit. Bro. All right. All right. Cool. So before you got before you got uh, put in your situation, Talk about how your your, your hip hop uh, situation was moving. Was there anybody talking to you? Was you in a situation or position for any deals? Like, what was your um your hip hop situation like prior to you going up? Yeah, I was um I was actually dealing with some guy named Live Looch, and he was like signed to Def Jam at that time. And um, the squad that I used to rap with was called Team A. I mean, and um, mm -hmm. he had wind up um linking up through us with one of his friends some old head named rome they used to cut hair so he tried to like take the best rappers out of our little group and then we start going up to def jam universal studios and we start recording in there and all that and it was the a and r boy i said this on another interview too his name was chris kellum or something like that and his brother was the a and r for like uh the singer case at that time y'all remember the singer case Hell yeah. 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 yeah so we was you know um i used to go up new york and um recording the Def Jam building and then he the the A and R boy actually had a studio in his crib too. He lived in this mansion, big old John. I remember going up that John. I was a young boy. And um they were saying that they was gonna, you know, sign me and stuff like that. But I had to be patient. But like I said, I wound up going to jail. It's like every time when I be getting a good uh, a good run, I wind up, you know what I mean, going behind the wall. Right. Now you went you went behind the wall. Um when you went behind a wall, how, how did things change? I know everything pretty much came to a halt. You know, you went for the um for the murder or whatever. Yeah. How did things change? Did you continue while you were locked up? Did you continue music or did you kind of lose interest for it? Because yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's a good question. I, I I lost interest for it because, like you know, like I I always been a. If anybody knew me, they knew that I always been like a religious, a real religious, deep religious person. So I knew right. that you know music was like you know it was forbidden in my religion. I mean. And um, they actually used my music against me in court. So that was like, that was that hit me hard, and, you know, because I wound up getting life behind it. They used my lyrics in court and stuff like that. So I was just on the type of time, like, man, F music. And, I, you know, I stopped, I stopped writing and all that type of stuff. Right. Now, now take, to, like, I couldn't even imagine that being in a situation. And you in court, and they say you got life. 
what went through your mind at that moment? Like, what was your first thought when they said you got life? It was, it was, uh, it, it didn't really, it didn't really hit me. It didn't okay. really hit me. It was just like, it was just like, you know, like, damn, you know, when he said, you, you know, life without the possibility of parole and stuff like that. And they gave me years with that too. Like, so it was just like, all right. But, um, it didn't really hit me until you actually like go upstate and then, you know, when you being processed and they telling you like, yeah, you know, your sentence is this and that and this and that. And you like, dang, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when it really hit home. Yeah. So how was it sitting in that, you sit in the courtroom and we went to AR Rab's um, federal proceedings a couple years mm -hmm. back and we seen how the fix is in. We seen how the defense was yeah. crushing the prosecution, but yeah. the judge didn't give a fuck. Prosecution didn't give a fuck. It seemed like they had it in for brother no matter what was said, right? Yeah, so when they're yeah. using your lyrics against you and mm -hmm. you sitting back and you thinking you entertaining folk, you spitting, you doing your thing, and you probably had no idea that this would eventually come back to haunt you. Right. What was your thought process like when they were using your lyrics against you as a hip hop artist? Well, how, how did that go through your mind? Um, It's a good question because it, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like they just be, it's like everything that we do out this job, man, being a, you know, uh, African American living in a you know an urban community, it's like they really use everything against you, and I kind of yeah. like seen that because it was like you know they kept showing my tattoos, my hair. It was just mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in that joint. I'm just like, damn, it seemed like everything was already fixed before I even got in this joint. You mean? Right. So like like mm -hmm. you said, I never knew that they was actually going to use my music, but then when they did that, I'm just like, damn, they just they just like my lawyer my lawyer said it he said it seemed like y'all just throwing a, a bunch of shit on the on the wall and see what's going to stick you know what I mean cuz it was just like they was just using trying to use any any and everything to degrade me to the um to the jury to try to get a conviction and they and they actually did a good job cuz that's what happened now i seen um i don't know if you know Ali Sadiq the comedian out of Houston brother's hilarious right so mm -hmm. he got these series called the domino effect he did he did time he did i think he did like 15 years out in Houston and yeah. he was talking about his situation and how he was a very religious but he still is a very religious brother and he's very mm -hmm. conscious of what's going on and when he got put in booking and he had to sit in shackles he realized he was in judicial slavery like he's back yeah. in slavery yeah when you were in there did it ever cross your mind being a religious brother and probably knowing you know what i mean the history of who we are mm -hmm. that damn i'm back in fucking slate like this is exactly what they this is slavery dog like yeah, how, how was the thought lot process with that it's like uh I think that's part of the constitution where it's though that's the only time where it's though you can be like treated like a a slave. Mm. Yeah. So it's you know you get you get like 27 cent an hour like mm. at, at in, in a job in that joint and it's just like mm. you you have no you have no freedom whatsoever in that joint. So it's just it is like it's it's modern day slavery. It, it really is. And then and when you when you sit back cuz I used to read a lot of books too when you sit back and you see how much money they actually making off of Every individual that's in there, it's like, oh, that's way deeper than crimes. Why? How y'all trying to make it seem? It's way bigger than that. You mean? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's you, deep. You, and the, the, the interesting part about your case is you got out, right? Mm -hmm. And then you went back again, and again, right? Did yeah. they yeah. convict you twice? No. All right. So no. So so okay. when I'm talking about the Dev Jam situation, and then I went upstate, I did like a little three to six, and then I was okay. home for probably like almost two years. And then that's okay. when I got booked for the uh, the homicide, and I got life, and then I overturned it. I mean, right. I, I won my right. appeal. I overturned it. I, I came back down to county and was fighting it all over again. I never went home, I, and I went back to trial again and got life again. Damn. So, uh, so, so you get man. life again? Yeah, I got life again, man. <laughs> what was your thought process when you got life again? And, Yo, and I ain't how, gonna... Go ahead. Yo, it, it was deep, bro. I swear, this is a good interview, man. Real rap, because no, I, I did a couple interviews and they ain't really, they, we ain't touch base with stuff like this. So, right. the second time I got life, because getting life the first time was just like, like I said, it ain't really, it didn't really soak in until you get processed. But the second time I got life, oh man, it was just like, yo, oh my God, like I just got life again. And then yeah. the whole thing was, right, once they sent me back upstate, I seen somebody who was coming down on court to go back down to the county and he was telling me like yeah man when you get back up to the jail don't talk to dudes man he said they was talking a lot of crap about you man saying you a dummy and all that you went back down there and got life twice and when he told me that i ain't gonna lie it felt like somebody stabbed me in my heart i'm just like it made me it, it did make me, it, it made me feel dumb but i knew my case though so it was just like you know 
nobody knows your case like you do. So I knew that I was going to keep fighting, but it, it hurt in the inside. Like, yo, I really just got life twice. Like, yeah. it was, yeah. that was, that was a deep, that was, that was a deep moment, man. Who were you? Did you have anybody on the outside that was affected by it? Your mom, pops, kids, anybody that was feeling yeah. it with you? Yeah, all of, of course, man. When you behind the wall, it just don't affect you. It affects your family members, loved ones, and all that, man. So you know, they was always supportive. My mom and my family members and stuff like that. They was always by my side and stuff like that. But you know, they be gone. They was used to be going through it too. I would hear, yeah. man. Every time I call home, it's like it's, they stressing and stuff like that. Or if I go do something and call home, because a lot of times we be taking a lot of frustration that we be having behind the wall. We, you know, once we get on them phone calls and visits, we be taking it out on them. Like they be doing something to us. But right, you know, right, right. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, you get out and talk. Take us back to the moment. I think it was Larry Krasner or something. The yeah. overturn, the overturn the conviction. Mm -hmm. Take us back to that moment when you get that news. Did somebody come to your cell? Do you get a letter? Like, take so, us back uh, to the moment. Yeah. So at my first trial, uh, the because I had crooked cops on my case. So at my first trial, they actually yeah. um, the so-called witnesses was already accusing this cop of misconduct, but. You know, he, the, the detective get up there at the time, you know, oh, I don't do stuff like that and this and that, this and that, you know, he spent it. But at my second trial, um, he wound up, I think he was fired at that time. So we was trying to call him and all that type of stuff, but they were saying he wasn't going to come to court and all that type of stuff. But he was fired at that time from doing misconduct. So I wound up losing again the second trial. Once I go upstate, now it's all in the newspaper about his misconducts and stuff like that. So. It was at the same time where so I was filing my appeal. So once I filed my appeal, um, the the district attorney office actually agreed that the cop did misconduct in my case. And that's when they overturned. I think I called home and my sister was like, uh, they overturned your sentence again. And I'm like, yeah. And she was yeah. like, yeah, they overturned it. And I was like, all right. But I, I wanted to hear it from the lawyer myself. So I'm like, all right, well, let me talk to the lawyer and see what's up. Because a lot of times, you know, they be... um. You know, people be so happy for you. They be just, they be they be saying stuff that don't be the truth. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So I wound up uh, I wound up calling him, and he was like, "Yeah, man." He was happy. He said, "Yeah, they overturned your sentence, man. Then you're gonna be coming back down to county. We're gonna see what's going on." And I, I was just like, "Man, I, you know, I, I, I was so happy, man. I, I was so happy, man. Like I was, uh, I ain't even want to talk to him no more. I said, I, I'll call you back another time, man. Yeah. 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 Now you got you got kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how how was it reuniting reuniting with them, man? Because I'm you know seeing them through the wall and all that visits, yeah, and then yeah. being able to hug them. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was it was, it was, it was heart touching, man. To come home, like I said, you know, uh, right now they're twenty. They just turned twenty in April. Um, okay. When I came home, um, it was just it was just to see them. It was just like wow, because they 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 my height. They look like they they look like they older than me. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then my baby son, like he, you know, he's sixteen. He taller than everybody. So it was just like wow. I remember when you just was a little man, and now you mm -hmm. taller than all of us. You know what I mean? So it was just right. cool just to be mobbing with them. I still be doing stuff with them now, even though you know they 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 got their own stuff going on now. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah, do man. them and all that, trying to do stuff. They'd be like, oh no, dad, I'm about to go chill with my friends, or no, dad, I'm about to. <laughs> I'd be like, all right, well, just you I mean, just let me know. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, well, day by day, why, why you behind the wall? I know you said you read a lot, and um, I would like to know one of your favorite books while you was in there. But what got what? what how was your mindset like? What got you through day by day, leading up to you getting up out of there? Hey, man, it was my faith. It really was my faith. Not you know, not losing trust in, in God, man. Like just knowing that you have a higher power and He's able to do all things, man. That's what that that's what kept me sturdy, and also knowing that. I already knew that it was misconduct in my case. Like when I first got my paperwork, I'm just reading the stuff and I'm like, this is a bunch of B BS, man. Right. So mm -hmm. that and my faith just stand strong and keep trying to stay, being, you know, being obedient and, and stuff like that. And that's what kept me real sturdy, man, throughout this whole time. Yeah. Word. So you get out, mm -hmm. you're free. You know what I'm saying? Your first mindset is, I'm out this motherfucker. What got you back into getting the hunger for music again? All right. So before I left, it was like, it wasn't that many platforms to get your music out and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think last time when when I was home, uh, uh, MySpace was out. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 MySpace yeah. was out. So it, it, <laughs> that's why I got booked. Yeah. MySpace was out. So you mean 
just being in jail and people keep telling me, yo, you could get your music on this and you could do this and you could do that and all the different social media platforms and all that. So I'm like, oh yeah. So I'm like, all right. So that's what made me like when, once I get out here because I'm like, I, more people need to know what's up with my music because I got my own little different s- style and all that. So I'm like, you mean, I'm like, you know, um, once I get out that joint, I'm going to still pursue it. Because I used to be writing on the low too. I started back writing on the low too, but I wasn't really telling people in jail like, if I came home, I'm still going to rap. You know what I mean? So once I actually got out here, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and try to push it and see what's up. What was, what was the um the toughest adjustment, you know, coming out of prison into the world? What was the toughest thing for you? Uh, It's it's like a, uh, it's like a big um gap between the, 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 the youth and, you know, um, the older generation, it's like a, it's a big gap. Mm-hmm. So adjusting to them and how they be doing stuff, I still be trying to figure it out. Like, like how is it <laughs> thorough? Like they just do stuff and you be like, what, what's, what's that about? And they be trying yeah. to explain to me. I just feel like, no, you, no, nah, man. It's like lack of principles that they, that they had, you know, these. So just adjusting to that, this is like, man, all right. Okay. Yeah. To kind of extend on that from a music perspective, when you listen to like drill music and stuff like that, and it's not the we always heard aggression in hip hop, we've always heard the lyrics, but now these young boys are laying out their crimes right here in front of everything. Yeah. On these yeah. records. Talk yeah. about that. How yeah, you so talk I, about that. So I came across a lot of that too, being in the county, and like, and that's exactly what they doing. They got cops that just watch the the uh, the the um the IG, the Instagram. So a lot of these dudes, they be you know they 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 put in work and then they go right on there and be you know make videos about it and stuff like because it, I, I mean people used to be telling me I, once when I got home like yo listen to this and look at this and I used to be like are you kidding me <laughs> like you just you basically just giving your whole situation up you mean and like I said I, I ran across a lot of those young boys they actually some good dudes man and some of them is actually locked up because. They was the one that was actually putting the work in, but the other homies was making songs about it. So they got them caught up. Wow. Yep. So yeah, that that drill, that that drill stuff, that it, it got a lot of dudes. It got a lot of them cooked. Got a lot of them cooked. Yep. So uh are you working on any project? I know you got a single or two out now. You got any projects you're working yeah, on? Yeah, so when I just came home, I just dropped this little EP called uh Only Trill Ones Allowed. It was like five drums on that joint. But okay. I got all these songs now, so I'm just I just had to put something out just to let people know that you know, right. like it's still there. Like I ain't right. I ain't lose nothing. You know what I mean, um, next project probably gonna put out this joint called Air Bleed, and I'm just gonna keep it pushing, man. Yeah, yeah, I, I know y'all pretty um familiar with the uh the boy Young Dolph. Yeah. Remember yeah. Young Dolph? He, yeah. yeah, he was uh I wasn't I'm I'm not gonna say I was a big fan of his music, but I liked some of his songs, but um. I liked his his repetition with putting out music. I, I was looking at his catalog. I said, God damn, this he really was working. And that yeah. really would got him really out there. Like he had music after music after he just kept putting stuff out. And eventually it came across, you know, the right people and you know the right audiences. And he wound up, you know what I mean? He wound up flourishing like that. So, you know, I got a bunch of music and I'm just gonna keep pushing it. Yep. Now you say you got your own style, but even within your style, we hear the essence of philly it's almost like a philly boxer or you know what i mean just somebody from philly you can feel the soul of philly we always appreciated that because we from jersey but right. philly hip-hop is some of our favorite hip-hop and we love when we hear newer artists or artists in general you ain't new been in the yes. game for a minute but just artists in general pay homage to that philly sound is that yes. was that important to you kind of never to change up your style never to go west or south or wherever the case but kind of stay within that philly essence even though your style is different yeah yeah this is Cause you gotta be you gotta be original. That's another thing too, right? Because it's gonna make you stick out more. That's another thing too with the rappers nowadays. It's like all them sound they sound alike. Yeah. Especially with the drill music, it's like all of y'all sound alike. Y'all, y'all might be talking about different guns and stuff like that, but y'all sound <laughs> the, the sound. You don't know where they from. You mean? Yeah. You don't know where they from. So it's it's, it's definitely um it's definitely good to, to you know keep your original sound. Like if you do you know. Like I said, like you just said, you come from Philly. You could just tell by, you know, your lyrics or the way you spit that you got the Philly sound. Yeah, it's, it's always good that, you know, to stay home with it. <laughs> you mean, and, you know, because you, you separate yourself from other people. You mean, and that's that's always a good thing. Yeah. Did you, uh, you did a song with Beans back in the day, right? Am I mistaken? Well, it wasn't. I was in his video. And that's another thing. They mm-hmm. use Beans. They use that video 
at my first court. trial too. That was the, that was part of the reason why I got convicted too. Okay. Yeah. So he put you in the video. Like yeah, I was in a video with him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So how, how, um, hitting hitting the streets of Philly again. Um, how did things change since you was locked up? You think like you know how you know the obviously you talk about the youth, but like what's the the biggest difference in Philly now from when you went in? Um, just like I said, just a, it it ain't really so much Philly. I think it it'll, it'll be anywhere that I went because you know I. Right. I was I had a lot of plans on going to a lot of different places and I still I'm still young going uh migrate or whatever. But uh it's just it's just adapting to, to, to life again, period out this joint. Just being a a civilian again. It's just like cause it's still unreal to me. I've been home now uh four months now. And it's still oh, it's still unreal. It's still unreal. I just be doing stuff like I be going in Walmart or just stores and stuff like that, and I just be like I'd be like, damn, I'm really home. Like, mm. like I'm really home. So it's still, it's still, you know, I'm still getting used to it. I'm still adjusting. How was COVID behind the wall? It was bad. It was, it was, it was bad in there, man. A couple um old heads that I knew, um, they passed away from COVID. Um, mm. but it was like before it, it it seemed like people was already having those symptoms and stuff like that, getting sick before they really like let it be known to like the world. You yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, once it hit in there, it was like it was you know it was it was no format of really like what to do. You mean? Because right. there was no real cure to it, nothing like that. So they was just making up stuff as you go along. Every like couple days, they making up new rules. All right, uh, three of y'all gonna come out. Uh, at a time today. Then the next day it'd be like, oh, all right, seven of y'all could come out, and everybody got wear their masks. And then, uh, then if somebody had sick, it could be a cold. They'd be like, all right, well, yeah, he got COVID. Now he's sending you to the hole for COVID. It's like, oh, hey. I just got a reg regular cold. I ain't got cold. So it it, it it was bad behind the wall, man. It, it was bad behind the wall doing that COVID stuff. So uh, what's next for you, man? You talked about your music. Um, if anything else you want to put on the table as far as, you know, what's next for you? Your floor is open, man. Yeah, I'm for real, for real, man. I'm, you know, uh, it's so it's so wide open out this joint with doing different stuff. It's like that's another thing right. too, like with LLCs and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's like a lot of stuff out this joint. So like I said, I'm just still like really, right. really digging in and really seeing like, all right, well, I could do this and I could do that. You know what I mean so I'm I, eventually, you know, because this rap stuff, I'm not trying to make this like a, a career. I'm not trying to be the best rapper ever. You know I mean, I, I, I want to come home, make some money off of it, do some shows or whatever. But I'm really trying to, you know, stack some bread up, whereas though I could start, you know, some type of business, whereas though I could pass down to the kids and stuff like that. You know I mean, that's what it's really about. Gener generational wealth. You know I mean, I'm sure you got some guys you was locked up with that you st still keep in contact with, man. Yeah. Um, how yeah. do you tell them to keep hope? Because you probably was up there with people that's never coming home. Yeah. That's crazy. I just got a phone call earlier yeah. from one of my uh one of my favorite old heads up there, John. And he just he he that's all he do is go to the law library. He really fighting this case, fighting, fighting, fighting. Wow. But um we we be talking about all types of stuff, man, about out here and how you know what's going on behind the wall now and all that. But you know, he he another religious person, man. It's it's when a lot of people find a lot of people find God in jail, man. Mm -hmm. They really do, man, because you know, you really you know, you're not you're not able to do the stuff that you was doing out here. So many distractions out here. So when yeah. you when you when you be behind the wall, you actually find God and you have time to sit down and focus and stuff like that. And that's what be keeping a lot of dudes sanity, man, because it'd be some beasts behind that wall, man. But then, you know, they get behind that wall and they see like, damn, man, I was tripping out there. You know what I mean, and, and, you know, they wind up finding God man, and, you know, um, humbling down and, and, you know, try to lead by example. To, the, to anybody young, you know what I mean? Because we, you know, these young boys is wild. They're crazy. Sometimes they don't understand the consequence of their actions until it's way too late. To any of them that are listening right now, how many people behind the wall would you say were happy about the crimes they committed and were cool to be up in there? None of them. Mm. None of them. And I'm wow. talking about dudes who really got time, time, like life sentences. Like, it's dude, like I overturned, I just overturned my case two times and that was like that was like some goat status right there but it's other people who like they had like more than one homicide and they just you know is it, is nobody wants to be in that joint man nobody right. wants to be in that joint so you know i don't care how 
you know, how much work you think you you done put in or what type of credit, street credit you done had out there, Joe. None of that matters when you in there. Because you're around dudes that was that did way more work than you, putting way more work than you out there in the streets. And they trying to get home. Everybody is trying to get home back to their family. You feel me? Yeah. So, you know, um, it's it's never been it's it's never been cool, you know, to to stay behind the wall. And if you want to stay behind the wall, then you 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 wear. You you wear it because everybody is fighting to you know to come up out of that joint. Yeah. Right. Nah, man, we definitely appreciate you. You know, you yeah. coming through, man. And um, appreciate much you success talking. to you and anything that you do. Um, if you can drop your social media handles where people can find you too. We All right. Find uh, on IG, I'm on uh on IG is Hollowrado Hollowrado uh H O L L O W R A H L O because sometimes people be spelling Rallo wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we yeah. appreciate you, brother. Thank That's you right. for just your transparency, man. It's going to help out a lot of people, bro. Great interview, bro. Appreciate you. Take care yep. of yourself. All right.